Sean, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. We got it. There we so, go. Uh, uh, Zoom was asking me to put info in, so we've sorted things out. You have my undivided attention now. Yo, man, whenever when COVID happened and Zoom was like, oh, my God, the stocks are going through the roof. They changed all their security and everything goes through a different loop. Now we got to hit OK for that stuff. But, you know, it's funny, man. I've interviewed I have over 450 interviews on my podcast. Um, and people wow. always ask me, like, who's your favorite guest? And I've interviewed some phenomenal, phenomenal people, you know, like Ed Milet and Andy Frisella and, and Burt Kreischer and just amazing human beings. But it's always the ones that I kind of look back in my childhood in some way, shape or form. And there's like a nostalgia part. Like I like, so for me, it's like Diamond Dallas Page was a phenomenal interview just because it was like my childhood. Ricky Williams, the, the Pro Bowl running back. Like it's all those. And and now you, man, I grew up watching Mighty Ducks. Like <laughs> that's every, really sweet. <laughs> dude, every day, every day I pretended like I was sick so I didn't have to go to school. I'd watch the Mighty Ducks, that and Back to the Future, man. But I'm excited to dive in. But why don't we go? Why don't we go all the way back to those times in your life, man? Because everybody thinks childhood actors, right? Like, how does it start? Where does it begin? Tell us a little bit about that journey for you. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because my our journeys began in a very similar place. Because I used to pretend to be sick so I didn't have to go to school, go to school so I could stay home and watch I Love Lucy. I love it. Like, that was the whole reason I would want to miss a whole day's worth of school and I would act really sick and then at like 9 30 when the show was over I'd be like you know I feel better mom and then by the next morning I'd have an upset stomach again so that's crazy so <laughs> I Love Lucy was I guess really the uh the first time I started like watching a tv show and was like oh my god I want to do that and I was even at that age I tried to like write um episodes I was like wow. the first Thing I ever did creatively was write an episode of I Love Lucy. So there we both got our start pretending to be, be sick, horrible, uh, despicable human beings. And look at us now. Just <laughs> look at us now. Um, yeah. So that was like my uh, where I got my start. And then um, basically I had two older brothers, two older sisters by a lot. Like my closest uh, sibling was a brother who was 10 years older than me. So my brothers and sisters would like, um, they used to get, entertain themselves by getting me to like, uh, hey, go over and uh, ask that adult if he gets laid, stuff like that. And I would <laughs> do stuff like that to crack them up. And they would make me, you know, uh, swear at people and stuff like that. And so um, then they would leave. And then I like I, I would get a, a favorable reaction. I would get laughed out of that. But then they would leave and I would just do that like on my own when they're when they weren't around. <laughs> and uh, I guess people just told my parents that, hey, your kid should be in. Uh, you should get this kid in movies before they arrest him or lock him <laughs> up. So my my mom took me to see a, uh, a talent manager that was holding like a talent scout. I think she had to pay four or five hundred dollars. And this was back in 1986. So just imagine. And uh, uh, parents do that today, by the way. They'll pay thousands of dollars to like oh, get yeah. their kids discovered. It's insane. Um, anyway, I went to uh, this talent scout and she uh, liked me and she got me into commercials right away. So that's how I got started in my young career. Wow, man. And the fact that you're able to jump right in, like a lot of times it's a struggle and parents are constantly dragging their kids to these auditions and trying to make it work. And then, and there you are now, obviously going back to most people knowing you at this point from, from Mighty Ducks. Right. And so what you were, what, 12, 13 years old when that happened? Yes. So talk a little bit, like, how did that transition work? Did they think the movies were going to be as big as they were, at least for my generation? What were the, what was the thought process? Well, I didn't find out until a few years ago, really, that the the hockey team was before the movies and they had the hockey team and then decided to make the movies just sort of an advertisement for the hockey team. I think everyone else sort of thought that was the opposite way around. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, no, I don't think anyone expected the movie to have like a trilogy when we first did the did the first one. And no, I don't think anyone expected it to have the kind of success it did. And it really didn't. It wasn't like a, a huge box office success. Um, definitely not by like today's standards, but I guess it did well enough to for them to want to make the sequel. I guess that was 
that's really proof that there was a hockey team and there was a sort of an ulterior motive for them to keep wanting to make these things aside from just the profit of the of the movies for sure now is obviously look you were you were a kid who was joking around with older adults and like hey you need to take your kid to do this is this something you you were like a hundred percent in on like you wanted to go through this path and understand oh, how totally. much work it takes? yeah yeah absolutely i mean i like just the attention of it all and just getting laughs um from an early age i i've always like yeah definitely uh um early on getting those laughs got me addicted to that sort of energy very early no for sure and like as i as i think about this journey you did a ton of movies through the 90s. I mean, all the Mighty Ducks, you're in Heavyweights. There's a, there's a bunch of other ones. When did it start to kind of like slow down for you, right? Like everybody talks about the childhood actor and then one day it ends. Was it a slow end to you or for you? Or was it like, I'm just going to keep auditioning and keep trying to make this work? Well, I, I mean, I guess it was, I guess uh, if, if it's either, if I have to pick between gradual or immediate, it'd be more of a gradual thing. I did a lot of television um, in between those movies i've done like 200 episodes of tv so that was a lot wow. a lot of that was on like tv shows that only lasted a season so i guess it was i guess my career lasted all the way up until i was 21 or 22 before work really died out and basically i had taken a self-imposed vacation basically i was just working so hard my whole life up until I was 19 or 20 and I had a, I was on a show called the Tony Danza show and it got canceled and I got a girlfriend for the first time and I moved into an apartment with my girlfriend. I don't think I left my apartment for maybe six months. <laughs> so I, and I stopped like showing up for auditions and I think my agent got really mad at me at that point. Cause they were like, Hey, we're, we're like, I was doing the no show, no call. Yeah. And that's just, you can't do that in any industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, and they would yell at me. They're like, you can't like do this, um, do this, meaning we're getting you auditions and like you don't show up to them. So I did that for a few months. And I did that for maybe a year. And then, I mean, it was it was really a while before I even tried to to start to get, you know, back, uh, you know, getting auditions again. So it was a while before that happened. And then I guess that would be, you know, I guess sort of my late 20s when really I was sort of removed from the industry altogether. Sure. Girls will do that to you, man. They, uh... <laughs> <laughs> if you're not careful. Yeah. You're no, not careful. You're... I mean, I, I fall, I fell victim to that many times in my younger life. And then you got to find the right girl. And then all of a sudden everything's like, Oh, I got to work harder. I got to, I got to do more for this, this incredible love that we have going sure. on. You know what I mean? That's, no, dude, I... you know, that's what it is. I mean, indefinitely in my circumstances, circumstances, it was always me falling short of what I really should have or could have been doing and not reaching my expect my potential, which really led to, I guess, the basis of all my, you know, stress and anxiety. So yeah. I'm declining a call. I'm going to go ahead and put this in. Do not disturb. Perfect. Hey, now we're talking. Now, now we're there. So, but dude, like it's, it's crazy. So you talk about feeling like you fall short and you weren't able to live up to others expectations. What, where do you think that came from? Was it, was it, what was, what's the word I'm looking for? Was it from the pressure of being a childhood star and acting in these movies? And because I'll, uh, now keep in mind, I've never been a childhood star. This is all from hearsay, right? They say it's a super stressful, super, you know, go, go, go type of atmosphere. Do you think that's where it began for you or was it before that? Perhaps that may, may have been where it began, but, um, you know, where my real issues set in, it really, it wasn't because of, of the industry. It was because of like putting uh, pressure on myself in mm -hmm. terms of like, you know, getting to, getting into a habit of like getting into a relationship where I'd win, try to win girls over with my value in money and things. And so that's really where I thought my value was with people. And it had been all my life. It, uh, at least I thought that that was the case. And so when uh, when those things dried up for me, I just felt worthless. When I wasn't on TV anymore and I didn't have any money anymore, that was where my value was. So I lost those things and I just felt, you know, you know, 
like less of a person really. Sure, man. And, and I think so many, I'm so glad that you're sharing this so openly because I think so many people can relate to that, whether it's on a big level or a small scale or whatever the case may be. I think that hits home for a lot of people to understand. Like if we put, if we have all these expectations on ourselves, like it could lead to super bad things. Now, like most people, you kind of came up in the news to me. I think it was like Yahoo News back when Yahoo a number of years ago was still around. I don't even know. It might have might have been Google. Um, but you know, I think, photos... I think Yahoo started like the where are they now? I think the Yahoo is responsible for that whole craze. It's Thanks, Yahoo. Fault. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this this photo, which is now infamous in many, many circles, popped up of you um, you know, uh in not such a great place. And, you know, finding drugs and an addiction and living on the streets. What, where did that whole process begin for you? Cause you don't, you don't go from being clean and sober to being on the streets overnight. Like what was that like? First of all, can I say first, uh, first of all, I love that photo. Um, because whenever people see me now, after having seen that photo, they're just like, Oh my God, you look so good. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for that photo. Now your question is really how, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I was so focused on my joke that I didn't. Re- I forgot about your real question. Which no, you're was, good, man. How did I feel like that wasn't a gradual thing? Well, no, that's something that doesn't happen overnight. Talk a little bit about how your introduction to drugs happened, and then you know how did you end up there? I uh, I was at a, a time in my life where three or four things had all happened all at once, and it created a very stressful situation for me. And I really had lost my mind. Um, I was engaged uh, to get married to someone and that didn't work out. And I couldn't stop thinking in a very unhealthy way about that person. And, um, you know, to the point where there's like a, you know, that feeling where it feels like there's somebody sitting on your chest. Yeah. Like bad, you know. And so when I found uh, Crystal Meth for the first time, it was a tremendous relief really because that pressure that i had on my chest that was an actual palpable pressure literally lifted and from the time i from the day i used that drug i didn't not use it until the day i stopped to get clean i guess it was almost a four-year period oh my god it's crazy to think about so i mean i guess what you mean is the degradation of my appearance and i guess that happened for me quickly um with different people i know meth like ravages your body at different speeds yeah with me it happened very quickly it affected my teeth after about two years of everyday usage i had rotted out the teeth pretty much out of my face and you know i was able to sort of find being on the streets amusing for the first year or so um because it was kind of like I was kind of just playing the part of this junkie guy that was now on the streets. Mm. And in a lot of ways, it just didn't feel real. It just felt like a role that I I was playing and I was managing, I was out there hustling and I was, you know, finding ways to maintain my hygiene. And at some point, I guess my, my, my health declined to where I just really wasn't taking care of myself and couldn't take care of myself. You know, when you can't, when you don't have access to a bathroom and a shower, you know, it's just not a, a good a good way to live, you know? But without getting into the, uh, you know, without getting in, into the weeds too much. So basically I had tried several times to to get clean by this time i wanted to get clean and i tried several times and i just didn't i didn't know how the the resources weren't available to me so i guess how did that happen it was it was a series of really bad mistakes that started to snowball at a pace that which i couldn't recover from and then there's, I just fell into a place in the system out here in Los Angeles where if you don't have insurance, it's hard to to get treatment that's, you know, at a place that's comfortable. Sure. There's, there's a couple of state run places out here that I had tried to go to a couple of times, but I left because they were just terrible. So 
finally, um, you know, I, I was in a position where I was, uh, thankfully, uh, I met a nice judge who uh, decided that I'd be a, a good candidate for the drug diversion program, which is a program where instead of you, instead of serving a sentence, which I was facing a serious sentence for a pretty serious charge. So instead of uh, having to face that, I would be allowed to try to get my life back together. And they gave me a chance to go into recovery and recover. And here I am almost January 25th will be my three year anniversary. That's awesome, man. Congratulations for that, that you huge win. Much. You know, addiction is a crazy thing. And people who know my story and my audience knows it. But uh, my mom had a 20 uh, year opioid addiction. Um, pills, solely pills that we know of. It ended up ultimately taking her life about six and a half years ago. And it was that whole idea of like she had she had opportunities to get clean and she had all these opportunities, um, but she didn't quite really have the support or the know how or anything else. And, and we talk about that internal thing that you were going through, right? The worth thing. And so what I say all the time is my mom didn't die from an addiction. My mom died because she didn't love herself. Right. And so after she passed I, away, I, I really co-sign on that comment. Oh, Sorry thank you, man. Thank, no, it's okay. And and so when I think of your trajectory, and, and I can't relate in, in so many ways, but she passed away, I had a, an engagement fall through around the same time, like all these things were happening in my life. And what I ended up doing was I turned to alcohol. And so I went on a, a bender six nights a week, blackout drunk, numbing pain, hiding things, and finally I was able to sit down and, and feel the pain, right? And, and from there, I was like, oh, wait, there's a purpose to this, right? And so now you're doing some great things in the addiction community and helping so many people in the homelessness in LA and all those things. But when did, when did it hit you like, Oh, there's a reason for this, or there's a purpose behind this? Has that even hit you? I'm assuming. Well, I mean, I don't tend to think of my own life in terms of like, I have a purpose or a reason. Um, I'm much more of a, we are like a, a you know, a rain droplets on a windshield type thing. Sure. <laughs> but um <clears throat> it definitely hit me at a certain point that I did have something to live for. And one of those things was my audience, the fans, however it sounds, it was early on in my recovery, a really powerful uh, thing for me to hold on to and want to get better for. And definitely maybe about, well, it was right after I got out of well, I guess about six months to a year after I had been sober, I was starting to receive feedback from people that were telling me how inspirational my journey has been in their own story and how in certain cases, my story was giving hope to other people. And that was definitely a shift in, in my whole thinking because um, now all the suffering that I'd gone through in those three or four years on the streets of Los Angeles as a homeless person could have a, a value to some people and it wouldn't just be for nothing. So it gave me uh, a focus and, you know, um, you know, just a, a purpose. And when I uh, speak or I, you know, uh, talk at, uh, addiction places, I definitely feel a, a tremendous sense of uh, fulfillment in that. I'm really proud of all my accomplishments. Uh, staying sober definitely is probably one of my favorite accomplishments, just because it's just unlikely, you know, most people uh, relapse because it's difficult. And so I've just, uh, I, I've been lucky and I have had the, the benefit of that support that you mentioned you hadn't had. But when, you know, it, it's just, it's the, almost the identical thing that you described with your alcoholism, same thing happened with my crystal meth and heroin. It's just a different substance. Yeah, man, for sure. I mean, addiction's addiction, right? There's a, there's a ton of different types of addictions, whether it be drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever. There's so many different addictions out there that so many people are struggling with. And, you know, you talk about us being raindrops on a windshield and it's so funny and you're like, I don't know if I have this purpose, but but you, you truly have a purpose in this life. And, and my visualization that I had, as you were saying that all these raindrops on a windshield, when you're driving, those raindrops start to connect to each other and they grow. Right. And so as I think about you as a raindrop on a windshield, you're connecting to all these people that need to hear your message. And this message is growing, right. And you're, you're making this huge impact. So I want to acknowledge you for that, man. Cause that's, that's a huge thing. 
not only that's staying beautiful. sober. I see your point and that's beautiful. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And, and so I, just, I just, you know, the, the reality is it's, it's really tough to stay sober, but then it's also tough too to, to speak about it the way you do. Right. And so that's, that's a huge thing, but I want to rewind a little bit to when that judge decided like you're a great candidate for this program. Talk a little bit about that program. That's a little bit different than the programs you were in that were a little rough and, and hard to kind of stay in there. Well, that was just a court um, program, but the program that really was different and made the difference for me was a treatment facility that I went to in uh, Antelope Valley in California. And that was a place called Quest to Recovery. And, and that was really just a place where I could feel, feel comfortable in, I don't want to say luxurious <laughs> environment, because you, you shouldn't, you know, have to uh, get hooked on drugs to get put up in luxury. <laughs> but it was just a great place for me to stay and the staff and everything. And it was just state of the art treatment um, and in a, in a wonderful, supportive, nurturing environment. And I was there, I was supposed to be there for 30 days and I stayed there for 90 days. So like most people don't want to go to treatment. I didn't want to leave treatment, literally. And I left there after uh, 90 days and I went into, into a sober living and I did nine months of intensive outpatient care over the COVID time. And so that's, I'm not good in math, so I'm probably off by four or 500, but that's a thousand hours of therapy. Mm. Yeah. So that's a lot of, you know, introspection right there. And I mean, I, I, you know, I've, it's, it's just changed my life. Um, also, I got really into yoga. Is this guy Sad Guru on your radar? Do you know him? <laughs> no, I've never, I've never heard of Sad Guru. Oh, you got to check him out, Justin. He's doing a yeah. lot of really great work in the world. And he just did this tour recently um, called Save the Soil, where he's trying to do bring a lot of awareness to the soil crisis on the planet. But anyway, I started doing a uh, meditation practice that I learned from him um, that I went to sort of a retreat and I learned over a weekend this practice. And I really can't explain it to you, but in my experience, after doing this practice for about five or six months, I began to wake up in the morning with a, just kind of a joyful feeling. <laughs> mm, that's awesome. And so I don't, I don't know how it works. He can tell you how it works. I can just tell you that I tried it because I was at a place where I needed something, anything, and it worked for me. So now I wake up in the morning and I'm just kind of in a good mood. And that's a tremendous shift from waking up in just sort of a depression and needing all these things just to get me back to baseline, just so yeah. I could be at, at normal to have a normal day. So starting off the day in this way has really changed my life. And it's definitely been one of the, uh, you know, parts of my treatment that's made it easier for me to avoid relapse. Yeah. I mean, I imagine if you wake up joyous, it's a lot easier to stay away from those crutches that you were leaning on years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, dude. So talk a little a bit more about to that. Do everything. Yeah, that's true. Like, talk a little bit more about that practice, right? So obviously, my listeners are junkies of things like meditation and tools that they can use in their life in order to, to live a more fulfilled life. Well, what did that what does that look like for you? You said it's a kind of a morning practice. What does it look like? Well, it's super easy to access on YouTube. And it's called the Isha Kriya, K-R-I-Y-A. And it's an 11 to 18 minute practice. And it's so easy couldn't be any easier and you just sit in one asana which is a very basic yoga pose and it, that just couldn't be any easier and that's kind of like step one to this sort of system and then this guy offers uh this guy <laughs> he's like he's definitely my guru but i feel weird about saying things like that around people because if you know before i experienced this relationship i probably also would have you know, not given much credibility to people who use terms like this. Sure, sure. So, you know, now that I experience it, you know, I, it's just, it's been fantastic. So the Isha Kriya is a great way to get into um, that practice. And, and, you know, 
yoga is one of these things where they don't want you to like believe it they want you to try it it's a very you know objective thing try it see how it works and if it doesn't work then don't use it so i did this thing and it is it has worked for me yeah i love it so my my fiance is actually a, a certified yoga instructor so i'm very oh, wow. yeah so i'm very aware of yoga and and over the last number of years i've gotten more and more into meditation but i also know i'm it now somebody who, like you who's into meditation now you're probably going to be like oh there's no such thing but i'm a bad meditator like i'm bad at just sitting there in my thoughts because i'm like oh, i got ten thousand things i got to do today like what blah, blah blah what was that like for you when you started obviously now so many so, so many times in you're good at it but what was that like when you were starting out with your head going into ten thousand directions well uh justin there's no such thing <laughs> as a bad meditator and that's true <laughs> But yeah, definitely at first, it was almost impossible to sit and focus my mind on anything or nothing for any period of time. And like anything else, you get better at it as you do it. A friend of mine literally said to me yesterday, um, I tried yoga, I tried meditating, but I wasn't any good at it. And it literally is like somebody saying, I tried going to the gym, but I wasn't any good at it. Yeah. Like you've got to go uh, many days in a row over a sustained period of time to see some effect. So this is just like that. And uh, it's something you have to strive for. But I'm I'm I've gotten much better at it now. Um, oh, you're, you're <laughs> your screen froze on me, but it looked like it froze while you had your eyes closed. So I thought you were just in some kind of like mocking <laughs> meditative yoga uh, chant pose. I'm a jerk, but not I'll that do. big of one. <laughs> damn zoom got dude I, I, but i love it man so what are some I, i'd love to know it and look here's the thing addiction is something that you don't get clean and all of a sudden the desire isn't there anymore you don't go through something you're like oh man i could just turn to that and and you know be enticed back into that world what are some of the other things you do to stay away from it to stay clean to make sure you're moving forward what are some of the other things you keep into your life well, before I say this, let me let you know, there isn't any kind of drug addict that was a worse drug addict than I was. I was, you couldn't, you couldn't get any far gone than I had gotten to the point where I was robbing stores every day to pay for my habit. So yeah. I was living on the street that bad. Okay. So basically the strongest component of my early recovery was prayer for me. And I was just earnestly praying to God to remove this obsession from, from me uh, because that's really the only thing I could think of at this point. And um, eventually, over a couple months, it just sort of manifested. And um, something happened, like a direct incident happened. And I, I knew at that moment that this monkey had been lifted off my shoulders. And right in the middle of the treatment place, I started crying and I made a quite a large scene. And I recently texted the or uh, sent an email to the counselor to see if she had any recollection of that. And she was like, I absolutely remember that day. Um, yeah, you were crying, yelling, I'm not a drug addict anymore. Thank you, God. <laughs> wow. I was like, exactly the day I'm talking about. Wow. No, and, and that's so that's so inspiring, man, to, to think about, like you said, you were the the worst of the worst. And that moment was the shift in your life to go, okay, now there's so much more in life that I can go back and recapture and, and begin th that next kind of journey. So what um what's next for you, man? Like what are you working on now? I mean, are we gonna see you on the screen again? Like what's what are the goals? That would be cool. Um, uh, it'd be cool to be in some movies and uh be on some television. I've, I've been focusing on stand-up comedy lately. I don't know if it's really stand-up comedy. It's more of like, I'm doing like, a, it's kind of like a public speaker, but it's just funny. Yeah, um, like a one-man show in a sense. Yeah, just because I feel weird attempting stand-up comedy just because there's so many masters at it. And I live in Los Angeles, so they're all like right on the end of the block. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. So, for me to call myself a stand-up comic is is daunting for me. So, because I'm really just a child actor, so um, I think that's what I'm gonna call my first special. <laughs> but um, so I've been doing stand-up, and people have been like so supportive. Like I get on stage, and they're like, "Please, God, be funny, please," and uh, they just cheer me through. So they've been um, so nice, and that's been great to get back up on stage doing stand-up again. It's something I've always wanted to do, but I've never really like 
you know, focused on it. So I'm doing that now and that's wonderful. And then I'm traveling around the country, going to signings and meeting people and, uh, and speaking at uh, rehab places. So it's pretty much my life now. Yeah, man. Which is, uh, which is such an incredible thing. And, and stand up is, is no joke. It's something that it always kind of is in the back of my head, like you should give it a try. So I do some speaking as well, you know, all over the country on, on a couple of things, but um, when I think about stand up, it, it terrifies me. I have, a, I have a good friend who is a full time speaker, like towards the world. That's what he does for a living. And he like decided to challenge himself. He's now done over 200 open mic nights and he's gotten paid a couple of times now. Um, and I went to one of his shows and was like, it was like an open mic thing in the beginning. And I could have done five minutes and I chickened out. I chickened out. <laughs> I was like, nope, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. But it's, it is such a scary thing to stand up there. And sometimes the audience can be cruel when you get, and I've seen it right going to shows and like, Oh my God, getting booed off stage. It's such a terrifying and vulnerable thing. Is that how you feel when you get up there? I gotta be honest, like that feeling of, uh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm obviously going to cancel the show. I always have that feeling before every show. And I almost cancel my show before every show. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't gotten that. Like, yeah, pretty much like, I, like I'm going to, I'm doing, I have a show tonight. And up until like about seven, seven thirty, I still might call the guy and tell him I can't make it. We'll see how that happens. But yeah, it's kind of like jumping out of an airplane, right? You just have to literally tell yourself I'm going to do it and you just jump. But the great part is how it feels at the end. Right. Yeah. So as good as it like usually life, like things are usually, you know, proportionately, you know, uh, uh, levied out so you'll find that you know the more challenging something is the more rewarding it'll be so if you're terrified of doing it i promise you as soon as you get off the stage you'll you'll feel amazing yeah so we'll see we'll and, see what happens and i, I don't wish... know you that well but just from talking to you a little bit i have a feeling you'll you'll be pretty good at it <laughs> thank you man i i appreciate yeah. that so we'll see we'll see next time i mean i live in the middle of nowhere pennsylvania um, but, but I, I travel a lot. So maybe the next time in a, I'm in a city, I'll go to an open mic and I'll, I'll give it a whirl. Uh, wish I was in LA, man. I'd come to your show tonight and make sure you don't cancel it. But, uh, <laughs> but dude, it's, you know, it's just absolutely incredible to see your growth and what you've been able to overcome. Not only the massive success you've had as a child, but the success you just had to overcome addiction and the success you're having now to inspire so many other people to stick on the path of, of, being sober and all the other things, man. So I want to ask you a question that I ask everybody on the show. It's a two-part question. The first part is, what is your definition of success? And the second part is, what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? Well, I don't know that I'd be able to give you a good second part of the answer if I didn't know the first part of the answer right away. And so my definition of success would just be um, living joyfully, period. Mm. Um, well, I guess that's not, I guess that's not, I guess that's not, uh, completely the case. And I guess success is to be measured on some level by the situation you have set up around. So I guess success for me, um, for me is just to be joyful and I don't want to say survival. I'm going to go with my initial answer, Justin, for me to be, if I could just be joyful, on self-start, no matter what happens around me, I'd consider myself a success. And what are three things I do every day? I have a major self-care routine. So I do more than three things every day. One of the, but I'll give you three. Sure. I, I do, I practice yoga. Um, I exercise. I pay attention to my diet. And I make sure to have, to stick to my work, uh, re, uh, regime that I have set up for myself. So right now I want to make sure that I work between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. on writing and then I have a certain time set aside for doing other things. So I stick to my work schedule and just by doing those things, I set myself up for a pretty good chance at a good night of sleep that night. I love it, man. Obviously you're you're attacking stand-up comedy, but what would be your ideal movie role? If you were to think of your life now as a good looking for, what are you 40 40 something i'm 40 i'm gonna be 43 this month so yeah so so as a good looking 43 year old by the way i believe we have the same birthday august 27th get out of here we do I'm, have the same birthday yeah i was you, born in 84 though do you have to yell that out so loud Justin, <laughs> when, you, 
<laughs> so you, myself, and Paul Rubens, who yep. was Pee Wee Herman. He sent me a card and contacted me on every birthday since we worked together when we were, I don't know, 30 years ago. That's even in amazing. the times, even when nobody could find me. Like, I don't know how he'd find me. I was like on the street and like I'd get a postcard like, happy birthday from Pee Wee. I'm like, how the fuck did he know where I am? Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, happy birthday. Um, but I was going to, there was a, what were you saying? I interrupted you. So yeah, you know? so as a as a good looking forty three year old man now, oh, right. what's your what's your dream movie role, man? I already know what that is. I would want to play Sad Guru in the Sad Guru biopic. Let's get it done. I love. Dude, it. By the way, I can't wait. I, I can't wait to look this guy up. Oh, you're gonna love him. Enjoy. Yeah, I will. I will, man. And and my follow up question that is, what is your obsession with Top Gun Maverick? <laughs> you know, I almost wore that t shirt to do your podcast and i said to myself bro people are going to think you have a major bromance with you better just cut it back on the top gun stuff um when i was a kid i loved that movie i saw that movie i wanted to be a fighter pilot um i made my parents this was in maybe what what what, what year top can come out 86 something like that yeah okay okay nowadays if you want to buy yourself a flight suit like one of those green flight suits that he wears on the movie you can get it anywhere. Amazon, the, the corner Halloween store has them. <laughs> Back in 1986, you want a flight suit. You have to go work for the Navy. You know what I mean? No. They didn't just hand those out willy nilly. I made my parents track me down a flight suit. I was just um, enamored with that whole movie. And uh, when I saw it again, it really did make me feel like I was 12 years old again watching a movie. So the fact that it made me capture that feeling, you know, I was just, I was in love all over again. It's a and great movie. It? Oh, it's God. Movie. It was Miles Teller's so good in that movie. And Tom, oh, man. And the whole Val Kilmer thing. Yeah, I'm they did a re- they did a really good job. A fun fun fact, by the way, Kelly McGillis, who's the blonde in, in the first Top Gun. She lives in my sure, hometown, yeah. um, like wow. where I live now. And I sold her a cell phone like 16 years ago. And like I, it was, I copied the receipt and kept it because her autograph was one. It's gone now. I have no idea where it is. But I remember that 16 years ago, <laughs> Kelly McGillis walked in. Sure yeah, dude, it's too good. That's so, awesome. so I wrap up every single interview with the same question. But before we get there, how do people find you? How do they get a hold of you? What's all the good stuff? Um, Instagram, my name. I'm on, I'm on Instagram. It's a great way to keep up with me. And that's pretty much all that kind of info that I have. Awesome, man. Yeah. So definitely go follow him on, on Instagram. And look, if you're in the recovery world, I would, and I'm throwing this out for you. I would, I would reach out, come bring him into your, your meetings and your facilities and, and have him come speak to you because I think it's a powerful thing to see your journey, man. So if you guys are listening to this, reach out to him for sure. Um, but Sean, like yeah, I said, I, I wrap up. Thanks, Justin. No, for sure. Now, like I said, I wrap up every single interview with the same question since the show is called the growth now movement. The question is in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Well, I guess it would be that moment that I already, I already talked to you about. Um, in that moment when I had, when I realized that uh, my prayer had worked. What other bigger moment can you, can you get to sort of redirect your life in your later years? Yeah, man. I love it. Sean, thank you so much for coming on the, sh- on the show, sharing your journey, all that stuff, man. This is a ton of fun. I appreciate you. And I look forward to staying in touch and seeing where your journey goes from here. Can't wait to see you on the big screen again as well. Same here. Yeah. Thanks, man. Keep in touch. And are you coming out to LA next, next week or soon? Are you? No, I wish I was. It's been, a, oh. it's been a while since I've been out there, but when I'm out, dude, I'll hit you up. We'll definitely figure that out. Yeah. I was talking about the, I was talking about your upcoming conference, but we'll talk about that when we hit, when you stop recording. Sounds good, brother. We'll talk soon. Okay.